turn on your Bible, pull up your Bibles or turn on your smart devices, you journey with me into the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And when you found the book of Ephesians, if you could navigate your way to the second chapter, that together we might hear the reading of God's word from the first 10 verses of Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. If you're there with me, won't you say amen? Amen. If you're still looking, say Bible study on Tuesday at 7 p.m. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Paul writes, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which once you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Look at that 10th verse again. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Today, as we get ready to hear a word from the Lord, would you just look at your neighbor and tell him, neighbor, neighbor. oh neighbor, oh, neighbor. I, need to get in shape. I need to get in shape. You may be seated in the presence of God. Now look back at your neighbor and tell him, you sure do. Amen. You sure do. I'm trying to get in shape. Um, I've been sharing with people, the Lord has um, been pushing and pressing me into writing of late. And there's a book the Lord has pressed on my heart that I've begun a journey into putting pen to paper. And the essence of the book is that I believe that there are certain issues and questions that growing and thinking Christians ought to always be wrestling with to help prepare them for the reality of the experiences of life. That life will put you in places that cause you to question some things about your faith, about your walk with God. And the book is really meant to help us wrestle with those issues that prepare us for the storms that inevitably come our way. Give an example, one of the questions I believe growing, thinking, and maturing Christians ought to be wrestling with is where you stand on the spectrum between providence and free will. How much of life do you believe is prescripted, pre-written, inevitably by God? And how much of your life is a direct result of choices you make of your own free will? Another question I think is important is the question of theodicy. Why do bad things happen to good people? I promise you, no matter how big your Bible is, no matter how many Sundays you come to church, no matter how holy you think you are, at some point your holy self is going to find yourself in some questionable circumstances that make you wonder how God could allow you to go through something like that. There are questions we need to be asking in life. And one question I think every growing, thinking, maturing Christian ought to be asking repeatedly along this journey of life is the question, what is the purpose for my life? Why did God place me here? What is it that God expects me to do? As you get older in life, you realize that you reach some places of dissatisfaction that cause you to realize that life has to be more than what I'm doing right now. Life has got to be more than just scratching and scraping to get by. 
Life's got to be more than getting up every day to go to the same old job just to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Life's got to be more than carpe diem, just trying to seize the day. It's got to be more than making ends meet. Life has to be about more than getting to the corner office with a six-figure salary. That God placed me here for more than just to sit on the dock of the bay. <laughs> wasting time. That instinctively we reach places where we know God has got to have more for us and what we're doing right now. And the question of purpose ought to drive all of us instinctively that we want to know, what should I be doing with the days of my life? It is that quest for purpose that led to the popularity of Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, read by millions across the globe, because instinctively, all of us want to know, what does God want me to do? The reason that's a critical question you need to be asking yourself is because I would argue to you at 42 years of life that life is only at its best when you align yourself with God's purpose for your life. That life brings you the greatest joy when you are where God wants you to be. That you feel a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment that you will never find doing life on your own as you will when you find yourself in the place that God has prepared, doing the assignment God has for you, walking in the will of God, fulfilling God's purpose, and being who God called you to be. As a matter of fact, I'll suggest, and I'm glad that we've got college students here, because you need to learn early that there are things you can do and then there are things you were created to do. There are things you're good at and there are things you are ordained to perform. You can do things that bring you money, but when you do the things God created you to do, it will bring you joy. And life is at its best when you get yourself in the place God called and created you to walk in. That's what Paul pushes to us in the second chapter of Ephesians. When he says in verse number 10 that we are the workmanship of God, created to do good works that God prepared beforehand. Here's what Paul says in Cliff Note Version, that when you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, you enter a place of life where you realize God has already assigned works for your life, and it's the expectation of God that you will fulfill his divine assignment over your life, which simply means this, that your life has a purpose. It doesn't matter how your mama and daddy hooked up, you have a purpose. It doesn't matter what your family background is, you have a purpose. It doesn't matter what school you went to or did not go to, God has an expectation of an agenda on your life. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you may be. If you are alive right now, that must mean that God has an assignment for your life. As a matter of fact, would you help me be a preacher this morning? Nudge somebody next to them and tell them your life has purpose. You are not here randomly. You are not here to live in mediocrity. You are not here to sit idly by on the sideline of life. You're not here to just let life happen to you. God has an assignment. God has an agenda. God has a purpose and a plan for what he expects you to do. Your life has purpose. Now, if you just clapped and shouted, you also know that the big question then is how do I discover my purpose? How do I know what God wants me to do? You know, my son, when he first started school, he went to a Montessori school. If any parent that's been in Montessori, you know that they have different workstations. And so whenever Deuce would go to school, he would look at the board. There was a board in the hallway that had the kids' names and the different workstations they were to go to. Handwriting, mathematics, science, all the other workstations. And so when he went into school, he'd look at his name and see where the teacher put a check so he knew what assignment he had. Wouldn't it be nice if life was like that? 
that God would just send you an email <laughs> and tell you this is the assignment on your life. This is what I want you to do right here and right now. The reason I say that is that it's not that easy. There's no sermon or a book that's going to tell you what God's assignment for your life is. There's no survey you can take, no assessment you can do online. You can take a test, send it off, they can send you back your statistical characteristics and personality type, but that's not going to tell you what God expects of you. And watch this, your purpose in life is not something you can be told. It's something you have to discover. Nobody can tell you what God's purpose and plan for your life is. God doesn't tell somebody else to tell you what he said your assignment is. And you better be careful of getting yourself locked into situations because somebody else was convicted and had discernment and the Holy Spirit and they told you what you ought to be doing. Can I just preach for a minute? The Church of Christ is messed up by folk who are preaching in the pulpit but were never called by God, but somebody in the sanctuary told them that they thought they ought to be a preacher and they took somebody else's word about what God's assignment is. Nobody can tell you what your purpose is. You have to discover it and rediscover it because watch this, the purpose and assignment and work for your life changes with the seasons of your life. There's not just one thing you're supposed to do that you find out at 20 and you do it until you're 80. That's not how it works. And I'm glad I got some college students here today to let you know that your purpose, your assignment of life may have nothing to do with the major you chose. Right back, let me prove it. How, how many grown folk in here today can wave a hand at what you're doing now and got nothing to do with the major you chose while you, Girl, I was an engineer in college. <laughs> Wound up in the pulpit. God changes assignment as our seasons of life change. Just look at Moses. The first 40 years of his life, God's assignment was for Moses to be raised in Pharaoh's house so he understood Egyptian ways. The second 40 years, God changed the assignment and sent Moses to the backyard of Midian so he could work with sheep to learn to be a shepherd. And then the third 40 years, God changed the season again and the assignment so that Moses would lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to the brink of the promised land. Every 40 years, God changed his assignment because as you change and grow and mature, your assignment of life changes. So what am I created to do? I can't tell you that, but I can share with you that God gives us some signs in our lives to help point us towards the work he's assigned for us. That just as there are signs on the beltway to direct you, the Lord has given some signs in your life that help you discover and discern what the assignment for your life is, what God expects you to do, where you ought to be spending your best energy in days. I come this morning to ask you a critical question. What is your spiritual shape? S-H-A-P-E. Five indicators that help you see the direction that God is moving your life in. Five signs that help you discover and discern God's purpose and plan for your life, the work that God wants you to do. There are five signs that help you figure out what that assignment for your life is. Let's walk through them very quickly. Number one, S, your spiritual giftedness. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says that God plants the Holy Spirit in your life. And the Holy Spirit is placed within your life that he may do some things that you cannot do of your own accord. The Holy Spirit guides you in the will of God. The Holy Spirit enables you to live a life that is holy unto the Lord. The Holy Spirit convicts you when you stand outside of God's will. The Holy Spirit counsels you when you don't know what decision to make. The Holy Spirit equips you to be a witness to the world of the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ. 
The Holy Spirit intercedes for you because you don't always know how to pray as you ought to pray, so the Holy Spirit kicks in and prays for you. And one of the most important roles of the Holy Spirit is to bring a spiritual gift to your life that allows you to go to work in the kingdom of God. Now, if you don't know anything about spiritual gifts, you need to begin your journey in Bible study in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that Paul begins to list out the gifts of the Spirit. And then in chapter 13 and 14, he teaches us how to use those gifts. And after you leave 1 Corinthians 12, you need to journey over to Romans 12. Because Paul talks again about how gifts are to be used and what those gifts are. Then you need to go to Ephesians 4, where Paul continues listing out spiritual gifts. And then you need to go to 1 Peter 4, where Peter talks about gifts. Go on, teach, Pastor. 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, Ephesians 4, and 1 Peter 4. And when you put that all together, you're going to see that there are little over 20 gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, as it relates to your spiritual giftedness, let me put three things out there. Number one, every born-again believer has a spiritual gift. If you've confessed Jesus Christ with your mouth and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you have a spiritual gift. You may not know what it is. You may have never discerned it. You may never have identified it. But I promise you, you have a gift from the Holy Spirit. There are many tools that can help you identify that gift. As a matter of fact, we're going to put one online in September on our website that will help you go through a survey to discover what your spiritual gift is. There are books that can guide you. We're going to have a course in our Christian Life Institute in the spring that will take you through the different spiritual gifts. But every born-again believer has a spiritual gift. As a matter of fact, make sure your neighbor heard that. Just touch them and say, you've got a spiritual gift. Uh, but number two, about the spiritual gift, whatever your spiritual gift is, it is not a military rank you wear on your collar to brag and boast about how Holy Ghost filled you are. Spiritual gifts are not things that we use to brag and boast about you so sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and you talk in tongues and you got this gift and you lay on hands and you make people pass out at the altar. That's not what spiritual gifts are for. Spiritual gifts are not things you list on your Holy Ghost resume. Spiritual gifts are tools God places in your hand to be used for the assignment God has for you in the body of Christ. So in order for me to identify what God expects of me, I've got to identify my gift because my gift tells me what assignment I have because it lets me know what work I'm supposed to be doing. And number three about spiritual gifts. Everybody has one. They're not meant to brag and boast. But every spiritual gift ultimately is used to bless somebody else. And you are not walking in divine purpose if your motto and mantra of life is me, myself, and I. That the only way you know you're in God's assignment and in God's purpose and living out God's plan for your life is when you allow your life to be a blessing into somebody else's life. That God calls us and blesses us that I might pass that blessing on to somebody else. The will of God is always to use me to encourage, to edify, and to bless somebody else. S your spiritual giftedness. Now, most people stop right there, and I would tell you that, that the spiritual gift is only but one indicator of what God may expect of you. There's another one, H, your heart's passions. The things that move on your heart. Now, I'm going to tell you that in your heart, you've got two things. The things that excite you and the things that aggravate you. And both of them get your blood moving. God says, some of the way I point you to what I expect you to do is through the passion in your heart, the things that excite you, 
the things that, that make your adrenaline flow, the things that get you up and moving in the morning, the thing you would do even if nobody paid you to do it because it brings you so much joy. Because the Lord says when you're excited about it, ain't nobody got to pay you to do it. When you're excited about it, you don't have to be chairperson of the committee in order to volunteer. When you're excited about it, nobody's got to give you a trophy and call your name from the microphone in order for you to be committed. When you're excited about it, you don't need a committee of a thousand. It could just be three of y'all, but you're so excited and it moves in your heart that that's where the Lord is pointing you. What excites you? There's, there's a group of folk in this church who are so excited about prayer that for a whole year they've been getting up at five in the morning to do nothing other than pray with one another. Nobody's got to call them. Nobody's got to have a 5 a.m. prayer recognition Sunday. Nobody's got to put their picture up on the wall when they think about touching and agreeing. It wakes them up early in the morning because they're excited about it. And the, some of us are so excited about children that we volunteer to tutor every Monday and we join Awana and serve every Tuesday and we don't get paid for it, we don't get a plaque for it, we don't get a trophy for it, but we're excited about children. What excites you? And if that doesn't point it out, what aggravates you? What gets underneath your skin? What makes your blood boil? You ought to have some righteous indignation. If you're just happy about everything going on in life, something is wrong with you. Something ought to upset you. The rising number of those infected with HIV within our community ought to upset you. Black and brown men being incarcerated at six times the rate of any other racial subgroup in America ought to upset you. Gun violence claiming lives on the south side of Chicago upsets me. Schools being closed down, children not being educated, men being raised with no father in the home, single parents being judged, something ought to upset you. Here's what the Lord says, whatever aggravates you is what he's calling you to. If it upsets you, don't run from it. Jump in it and make a difference. Jump in it and turn it around. Volunteer and help save a life. Whatever aggravates you, God is calling you to it. Say, make a difference. Your spiritual giftedness, your heart's passion may direct you. Let me tell you the third thing that may direct you to the assignment God has on your life. Your abilities and your talents. Now, these are different than spiritual gifts. When I speak about spiritual gifts, I'm talking about the gifts listed in the Bible that the Holy Spirit brings. But beyond that, God creates each of us with natural abilities and talents. You're good at something. Yeah. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, Linda, Linda, Linda. Linda, Linda just wave your hand, Linda, sorry. Linda and I share a natural ability to sing. <laughs> she fills in for me every now and then. The choir. Now, now, singing is not a spiritual gift, but it is an ability and a talent that the Lord birthed within Linda. My musicians are gifted. I don't know where they are. But they're... <laughs> but, but they have a gift. They have an ability, they have a talent. Half of us in here took music lessons only to find out that wasn't my talent. <laughs> Thanks, Melvin.
God creates us with abilities and talents that he births us with, watch this, so that we could fulfill Proverbs 18, 16, that says that our natural gifts, our abilities, our talents will make room for us and bring us before kings and queens. That literally, this is what the Lord says, I gave you something you're good at in order to use that as a key to unlock doors for greatness in your life. That in an ideal world, my ability and my talent will lead me to my career. So some of us are naturally gifted, talented, and able in strategic planning, in event coordination, in decoration, in poetry, athletically, intellectually, as a writer, in math, that God has given us abilities and talents that when utilized correctly, open the door for greatness. Now, now let me tell you, because I know a whole lot of people with abilities and talents that ain't doing nothing. Because there are three things you gotta know about your ability and your talent. Number one, no matter how talented you are, your talent and your ability must be developed through the discipline of hard work. There's no ability or talent you have that's so great that it doesn't require hard work, rehearsal, discipline, practice, tuning, honing. You've got to be diligent about developing the talent and the ability that God has given you. Number two, you've got to use that talent and ability when there's no reward. So many people want to wait until there's a big stage and a payday. Let me tell you, you'll never make the big stage if you don't learn how to use your ability and your talent when nobody's looking, when it's just a small thing. Here's what Jesus says, how can the Lord make you ruler of many if you don't learn how to use it over a few? If you're not faithful over the little things, God will never promote you to the large things. So no matter how able and talented you are, you've got to use it even when it's not on a big stage. And number three, your building, your tally, it may not be a gift of the Holy Spirit, but it is a gift from God. And that means God can only use it to bring you to greatness when you give God the glory for your ability and your talent. God says, I can't really bless people who are so able and talented that they think they just got there by themselves, that you were just born that way, that you can pat yourself on the back and say, look how good I am. No, the Lord says, I need to bless some folk who realize that God gave me this ability. God blessed me with this talent, and God gets the glory out of my life for what he enables me to do. So what directs me? My spiritual giftedness, my heart's passions, my abilities and my talents, let me give you the third thing that will help direct, fourth thing that will help direct you to your assignment of life. Your personality. Your personality. Your character. Your flavor. Your swag. That, that God has created us with different personalities. And here's the beauty of God. God always works with a variety of personalities. Look through scripture and you'll find God working with people with different personalities. Everyone did not have to be the same in order to be used by God. God allowed them to be who they were in their person. They may have had to change their ways, but their personality was what God used them for, for the thing they were called to do. Peter was a loud mouth gangster, but God used him. John was quiet and soft-spoken, but God used him. Thomas was a skeptic and an agnostic, but God used him. Paul was confrontational and liked a good old fight, and God used him. Barnabas was an encourager and a comforter, but God used him. Jeremiah was a sour, sad puss who cried all the time, 
but God used him. David was a charismatic party man who liked to dance till his clothes fell off, and God still used him. Vashti was a rebellious, independent soul sister who did things her own way, but God still used her. Rebecca was cunning. Ruth was ride or die. Mark was an avoider. Apollos was a people person. Sarah was a pessimist. Caleb was an optimist. Noah had OCD, Martha had ADD, but the Lord still used them. Because there's no call of God on my life that requires I be inauthentic to who God created me to be. That if it causes me to be insincere and disingenuous, it cannot be God's calling on my life because the calling of God demands authenticity that says I don't have to be anything or anyone else other than who God made me to be when I'm walking in my divine purpose. Will you help me play preacher to your neighbor? Just nudge somebody in front of you and tell them, girl, be who you is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deacon DeSandys, that got me in trouble when I came to Alpha Street and the Lord called me here back about 2008. When I first started this journey as a shepherd, I was criticized because my personality was so different than my predecessor. The church had been used to 40 years of Jerry and old Peterson. Hey, they love old Peterson 40 years. And my style, my personality <laughs> was different. And I got emails every week by folk who didn't like the way I was operating in the pulpit, the way I preached the gospel. So I tried to be Peterson, but around about 2009, I just decided I can't be John O. Peterson, but I can be Howard hyphen John Wesley, and I'm just going to do me. And I decide to be me. Now, now me, me will quote some songs that ain't in the hymnal. Me going to crack some jokes in the middle of the sermon that some of y'all don't get. Me going to be transparent about some stuff I ought to keep to myself. Me going to shed a tear every now and then because when it hurts, I can't hide it. Me is going to talk about Deuce and Cooper because I love them with all my heart. Me is going to wave a hand when I think about the goodness of God. Me is going to jump every now and then because I'm excited about God. That's just me. Y'all, y'all know, those who've been here for a while, that this wasn't always the podium we had up here. We had that big Kevin Old School Baptist one. And I had to get rid of it. And somebody asked, Pastor, why you get rid of that one? Because I couldn't rock it the way I need to when I feel like being me. Because when I want to be me, I want to shake that thing. And I need something that allows me to be me. I'm just me. And the Lord has an assignment that allows you to be you. Your spiritual giftedness, your heart's passions, your abilities and your talents, your personality. And then finally, let me tell you, God can direct you through your experiences. The things you go through oftentimes point you to what God expects of you. Hear, hear me, I, I pastored long enough now to tell you that God speaks purpose in the midst of crisis if you're listening. In the midst of tragedy, God reveals purpose. When the foundations of your life are being shaken, God will point you in a new direction. 
when you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, God will give you a new assignment on your life. Because whatever the Lord delivers you from, watch me, he'll send you back to. Don't miss that. That's the tweet of the morning. Whatever he brings you out of, ultimately, he'll call you back to it. I'll tell you a story about a great couple in our church. They're here this morning. Named Jeffrey and Kiana Ross. Back in 2009, they were blessed. Beautiful baby boy, Jeffrey III, they call him Jay. Before Jay's second birthday, he was diagnosed with extreme and severe form of cancer. Like any parent, they did what they had to do to try to save their son. Praying and going through the cycle of all cancers, remission, reoccurrence, remission, reoccurrence. Jay's cancer got bad. They had to have surgery that left him blind. And even though he was blind, I remember visiting with him. He's just such a happy young boy. Things got worse. And there came a moment when they had to spend almost five months, half a year, living in New York and going back and forth from New York to Virginia so that Jay could get the treatment he needed in New York. Now, pause for just a minute. Do you know what it's like? to have to pay to live in New York and maintain a home in Virginia? Can you imagine what it's like on your job when your sick days run out? You gotta choose between going to work and going to a chemo session for your child? How your job is put in jeopardy? It's a very arduous journey for him. In 2012, Jay passed around the holidays, and was arguably the most difficult funeral we've ever had in this church. Any parent in here, you don't need much imagination. As a matter of fact, that's the one thing you don't want to imagine, what it's like to lose a child. The pain, the agony, the, the questions, the frustration, how life seems upside down. That's an experience that causes many people just to lay down and die. In the middle of that experience and that tragedy, the Lord began to speak to Jeff and Kiana about an assignment he had for them, an assignment to go right back and to start helping other parents who had to walk down that journey. So they created the J. Ross Foundation in honor of their son, they began to raise thousands of dollars for one purpose, to be a financial blessing to parents who've got to maintain two homes and live in a different city while caring for their child with cancer. And in 18 months, they have blessed 17 families with help and aid and assistance to help them in the midst of that. I'm going to ask, just so you know who they are, Jeff and Kiana, would you just stand as we thank God for what he's done through that experience to aid you all. I want you to go to jrossfoundation.org and look it up. But an experience that could have destroyed them. God used it to point them to a new purpose where they took something that excited and aggravated their heart and used it as a way to bless somebody else. We are his workmanship and we are created to do good works that God has prepared for us beforehand. There's a purpose for your life. 